of the Friends of the Hampton Public Library. Um, on behalf of the Friends, I welcome you to the 41st Hackley Lecture. The Friends not only sponsor this lecture, they also um, support the programming for the adults and children at the library. We've contributed um, the renovation of several rooms to the library, including the renovation of the stained glass windows, and please look at those when you go to the reception. Uh, to do this, we have fundraisers. One is a bling thing, which is a jewelry sale, and another one is our book sales. I urge you to help support us if you can by donations of jewelry, books, and um, on behalf of the friends, please enjoy the lecture. And I'd like to introduce Joe Zapapaska, who is the director of the library. Thanks for coming tonight. It's really great to see everyone. Um, I, as Marty said, I'm Joe Zappacosta. Uh, I am the director of the Hackley Public Library. I've been there for about, I'm in my fifth year now. Yeah, that's, the time's going quick. Um, this is my fourth lecture. We had one canceled due to COVID. And then the next year, um, so this is my third in person because we had one that was virtual. Um, so. It's great to be in person, obviously. It's almost a fading memory now with COVID, but that wasn't even that long ago, really. So it's just great when you can have big crowds and I feel great to see everybody. So tonight what I'm gonna do is just give you a little history. I'm gonna try to keep it interesting and fun and be brief. Um, and then thank a bunch of people because uh, there's so many people that helped out to make this um, a, a successful evening. So um, the Charles Hackley Distinguished Lecture for the Humanities is a highly regarded yearly occasion that seeks to encourage and acknowledge the humanities in a significant and inspiring way. It is uh, named in tribute to Charles Hackley and his charitable contributions and dedication to the community. The lecture series provides a forum to explore the significant themes and concepts shaping our understanding of the world. Um, and what I remember from what people have told me about this event, it used to be a, more, a bigger event. There was um, other parts that happened. Um, and one of them was the presentation of a um, essay award, which was a monetary award, which um, we still give out. It's called the Robinson Essay Award. And um, there's the first prize, there's the second prize, and third. And uh, the, the, the first place winner gets a $2,000 scholarship award. They can actually use it any way they want, so it's just a gift. And then the second prize is 1500 and, and third was 1000 This year, all the uh, recipients are students at Mona Shores. If you know an English teacher in Muskegon County, because this is open for Muskegon County students, it does require the teacher or uh, head of the department to submit the work, so the, the students aren't submitting it, it's their teachers. If you know anyone, encourage them to give us some of their work so that we can have plenty to choose from when we're uh, giving out that award. Um, but like I was saying, uh, that used to be a part of this event and um, we would give the award out, but now I just go to the event and hand them out. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about what this lecture series is. Um, we feature notable speakers and recognize their expertise and significant <coughs> contributions to the humanities. The speakers may consist of prominent academics, writers, artists, um, intellectuals who have significantly impacted their respective areas of study. And they are always from Muskegon. I got that question tonight. Um, yes, David Hogan is from Muskegon. Um, they are invited to share their insights, knowledge, and perspectives on subjects encompassing various aspects of the humanities such as literature, history, philosophy, and culture and the arts. The goal of tonight's event is to stimulate intellectual discourse and critical thinking within our community. What we learn will allow us to expand our understanding, challenge our preconceptions, and engage us in meaningful conversation. 
By exploring the humanities through the lens of people at the top of their fields, we hope that you will gain a deeper appreciation for the value and relevance of the humanities in your life. Um, now, we also, uh, the lecture series not only just honors the Charles Hackney legacy, um, but also reinforces the importance of lifelong learning, intellectual curiosity, and the pursuit of knowledge. Also, we um, give out another award tonight, and that is for someone who goes, that has gone well, far and beyond in um, supporting and doing things for our community. Um, it serves, all this event also serves as a reminder that the humanities play a vital role in shaping our society, fostering empathy, and enriching our cultural fabric. The Charles Hackley Distinguished Lecture for the Humanities is an event that inspires and empowers individuals to explore the depths of human, human thought, creativity, and expression. I had a pleasure this afternoon of um, having the chance to uh, meet with David Hogan, Dr. David Hogan, and we, um, I gave him a tour of the library, and I took him over to the Torrent House, and I was really excited and encouraged <laughs> to know that we had a lot of good works over there, um, uh, significant, um, good standard works in, uh, in history, so that was, that was fun. Then we did a little walk around town, and he was talking about he hadn't been there for a while, and he was saying all these very good things that you know, it looked like things were really happening downtown, so that was very encouraging. So that was fun. Um, I also want to just recognize that this, again, is the 41st event. So um, there's 41 other speakers that came before tonight. And I like to just take a, just a moment to feature someone who was our speaker in the past. I picked um, our second speaker. She was our very second speaker. I picked her because she has a, a similar um, background, not really. But sort of. <laughs> so, um, our second annual Charles Hackley Lecture in Humanities, her name was Dr. Marion Sine. Um, that's how I, I believe it's pronounced. Um, she passed away in 2005. She lived in Cleveland, Ohio at that time, but she was born here in Muskegon in 1913. Dr. Sine completed her education at Muskegon Heights and graduated in 1923. She followed her studies at Muskegon Community College, uh, then went on to get a doctorate from the University of Michigan. In 1957, she published um, her <coughs> most well-known work titled The Allied Blockade of Germany in 1914 through 1916. And Dr. Sidney's uh, contributions extended well beyond that, where she published other authored other numerous other articles on World War I, and um, for an impressive 42 years, she served as an esteemed faculty member at Case Western Reserve, leaving a, a big mark on that, that institution. Then she retired in 1983, and that was the same year that she spoke as, as part of the Hackley Lecture. So, again, now I just want to thank a few, uh, thank the friends for sure. I just, it's, I can't really express all the gratitude for what they've done in keeping this event happening every year. Um, it's through them that, it, it, you know, it, otherwise it would fade away probably. Um, so I'm just very thankful to them for keeping it going and having, uh, lending their time, their volunteers to have this event. Um, I want to say uh, thank you also to the um, remarkable work of the nominee committee. Um, their diligent efforts in curating the list of nominees for the esteemed Hackley Lecture and thoughtful selecting of community honorees have undoubtedly elevated the significance of this event. Moreover, their careful consideration has endured or ensured that we honor individuals who have profoundly impacted our community and are a source of inspiration. I also want to thank all of our um, the donors and supporters and um, those who have donated towards the event, and they, you can see those. Uh, those names in our program. Um, and thank everyone. Um, so then what I'm going to do now is I am going to introduce um, the person who's going to introduce our um, our accommodation for service in humanities. Um, he is the board chair 
of the art museum, the Muskegon Museum of Art, and I'm sorry. I go back one slide. <laughs> Benarin. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> you just told me your name and I drew a blank. So he's going to introduce our comment. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure for me uh, to introduce Judith Hayter to you. And I have a four-page speech to give and <laughs> learn that I have three minutes to do it. So. The title of this effort is Hey You. Have any, have any of you heard Hey You? I'll say this for the end a little bit. But as I was looking at the program for tonight, I decided that I'd better find out what the definition of humanitarian is. And so I went to uh, the good source, Google, and uh, I think that it's pretty simple. It's seeking to promote human welfare. Pretty simple. But it's to do it with impartiality, neutrality, <coughs> independence, voluntary service, <coughs> unity, and universality. And in order to be considered a humanitarian, and I would say that Mother Teresa is the ultimate humanitarian. So to give you an idea of what we're talking about here in terms of scope and scale, but we find that we can have humanitarians at all levels, and we have humanitarians in our own community, and Judy, of course, is one of, uh, one of the most recognized. Uh, and uh, I would say that one of the things is very important about her career, and, and it's a lengthy one, is that her focus has always been on the community. It doesn't matter really the position that she held, she had a wider view of why she was doing it, and she, she, uh, she supported people above all else without any rancor, without any prejudice, without any discrimination. It's hugely important in the world, particularly today, I think. She's well-educated, Eastern Michigan University, Western Michigan University. I think she's a Michigan State fan. I'm not so sure of that, Virginia, but uh, I think she is. Her professional work uh, is extensive. Uh, she is an educator. Uh, she was a counselor. She was an executive director. She was a director. She was an assistant superintendent. She was a consultant. I can list all these organizations that she's with, but remember, I only have a few minutes here, so we can't do all of that. But importantly, I think the things that, that she's most remembered for is her work with the County of Muskegon, primarily in job training and, and, and developing people, her work at the Muskegon Public Schools in various capacities, uh, and, and she was a counselor all the way, but she also worked in adult education. She worked uh, as the assistant superintendent um, and then, of course, uh, last but not least, she was the executive director of the Museum of Art. And I get the uh, great uh, privilege of serving as the chair of this organization right now. I can tell you that working with Judy has been a, a real blessing. I do believe that uh, the Museum of Art work uh, is probably some of the best example of uh, Judy's humanitarian efforts because she transcended the job. Some people can think, well, you, you have a job, you do the job, you work the job, it's nine to five. Uh, that's not the case with Judy. It's 24 seven, let me tell you. Uh, and um, I think that if we talk about some of her work and then related to the, this award, we can see why she's being honored. Uh, one distinguishing uh, effort was the Edward Curtis exhibit of the American Indian. If you just think about how challenging that was to do 
and some of the controversy that was associated with it, and the sensitivity that had to be brought to that effort by bringing in speakers to talk about uh, the whole issue of the treatment of the American Indian made it a, a magnificent program for the Muskegon Museum of Art. And during that one summer, we had over 40,000 people attend that exhibit from every state in the United States and many, many foreign countries. And she led the effort of that, and she was the spirit behind it. But she also put on a show of the uh, American uh, Negro uh, Baseball League, uh, Kadir Nelson's art that has traveled the United States, right? and we were one of the first places to have it. She brought, it, she brought an exhibit of 9-11 here, one of the few museums in the country that brought artifacts from 9-11 to show our, our, our community. World War II, the Bennett Prize. Uh, I don't know if some of you may have heard of it, I hope you all will hear of it eventually, uh, but it's honoring American artists, American women artists in the United States in a competitive way. And this last week, we just awarded the third Bennett Prize winner uh, that receives $50,000 in a solo exhibit in the next year. All of these are, are really, in my mind, examples of what Judy has done to transcend uh, the ordinary work world and become a humanitarian in our own community. She also volunteers. I mean, even to this day, she still volunteers. She, she worked uh, to raise money for the White Lake Playhouse at White Lake. Uh, she worked to raise money for an elevator for the Heritage Museum. I mean, that was a, a real interesting uh, piece of work. Uh, and she will volunteer uh, uh, just for about any good cause that you ask her to give you a hand with. And importantly, she worked with the museum expansion. We're, we're going to dig a hole out here so you couldn't get in, in the front, but we're starting with that. And uh, even after she retired from the Museum of Art, she agreed to work on the capital campaign. That's saying a lot about the character of Judy Hayden. Um, she continues to work with the Downtown Arts Committee. And if you've noticed, there are a few pieces of art around the community that we didn't have a few years ago. Uh, including a little blue uh, dot of water in front of the L.C. Walker and the Convention Center. On a personal note, I've known Judy for 49 years. I've worked with her, for her, against her sometimes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and over that time, we've become friends. And that's where the hey you comes in, because almost every time she called me up, the very, very first thing she says, hey you. At first, I thought it was a term of affection. Uh, and, uh, and then I realized that she had something in mind that she wanted me to do. So, and uh, that was often to raise money for some projects that she was looking uh, to stage somewhere. Uh, some personal things that you may not know about her, she is a, a collector of folk art uh, and uh, American folk art. And it's the most amazing stuff, but you have to really see it to, uh, to believe it. It's a little on the, the weirder side of things. <laughs> we don't have much of that in our museum, for sure. Uh, 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 she's also an outstanding cook. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we actually participated in a gourmet club together. And many of us have just talked about having her do the meals and we would just show up. <laughs> That'd be fine. Um, and uh, the one last thing I would say is that uh, she does think she's a, a good euchre player. Uh, and uh, we get together often to play euchre. But uh, hey you, I have to tell you uh, that your long-term partner, Shar, is a better euchre player than you. <laughs> It is my pleasure to introduce you to Judith Hainer, Muskegon's Humanitarian.
be here a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> just slightly hobbled. Yes, just slightly hobbled. You're right. Okay. You're right. Thank you, Frank Benary. When they called me and told me that I received this award, there was only one person I thought of to do the introduction, and it was you. So thank you. Um, one of the things that I love about this town, and a lot of you may know that, is the people of this town. I think it's the most remarkable community. Um, and the other thing that I've always loved about Muskegon is that you can make something happen here. And I love that. I love the fact that we can make things happen in this town. Um, and it's because of you. It's because of the people of this town that, that are willing to lean in and to be part of creative ideas and creative solutions. Um, I always talk about having left Muskegon three times, but moving back here each time until I finally understood I was just supposed to be here. But here's the real deal. In 1984, when I decided I need to leave Arkansas after six years and a baby, and started looking here for a job, there were remarkable people here who believed that this 36-year-old woman had something to, take, that, to offer to this scrappy little town and to the 10-year-old agency that they had done everything for to build and to create, and that is every woman's place. Phyllis Wahlberg, you're here tonight. Jackie Fisher, you may be here. Bobby Norris. These are women that did not know me until I interviewed for that job. And what's always interesting to me is to think about what is, what is it that they saw in me? It was that opportunity that I was given to come back here and make a difference because there were some people willing to take a chance on me. And always grateful for that. Paul Roy is another one. He's the one that told me that that job was open. So it's those opportunities that people bring to you that are amazing and give you all the opportunities that you have. Thank you, Frank for mentoring me early on. 49 years seems like a long time, but I'm not gonna argue with you. Um, so, he was an excellent mentor, and I'll never forget this particular moment. So the county held the books for EWP. So I come in, you know, I'm gonna run EWP, but they're holding the books, meaning that they're holding the bag for finances and all that. And I'll never forget that lovely conversation, this gentle, kind, firm gentleman who said, you got to get this budget in the black. Okay. <laughs> and I did. I think I managed to do that. Um, the, the, then it's the leadership of Muskegon Public Schools, and I cannot tell you how proud I am that Joe Schultz is here somewhere in this audience tonight. Um, but it's, a, it's a, the leadership of Muskegon Public Schools that also saw something in me and that thought that I had something to offer. Mike Seppichi, who I worked for in the 70s, 1970s, thought I had the skills to run the adult ed program and asked me to do just that. Joe Schultz, our superintendent at the time, kind of a new superintendent, had to take Mike's word for it. He didn't know who I was. Um, and then he just had to assume it was all going to be okay. And thankfully, Joe decided to trust Michael's judgment. Little did either one of us know that I actually was Mike Seppichi's retirement plan. You know, so, so it was a long time plan that he had to leave, so. Um, but Joe, I, I so appreciate you being here tonight and so appreciate you, again, taking, rolling the dice and taking a chance on me. Fast forward again to 2003. Now we have Gary Ostrom, Frank Benaric, um, and Mike Seppichi, kind of working in concert now, who all decided that they thought I might be, have something to contribute to this place. Um, and it was really just almost blind faith uh, that they decided that that might be a good idea. Um, but to have those people have that kind of faith in me is something I will always be grateful for. Um, I've worked beside the very best in Muskegon and every time it has made me better, a better thinker, a better planner, and a better leader. I've also had the best jobs in Muskegon. Sorry folks, I've had the very best jobs. EWP, the adult education directorship, the assistant superintendent, and then this. Nothing beats this place. Um, I'm so honored, honored to be a part of the group. I mean, and then we add this whole experience to it. I'm so honored to be a part of the group that you all have honored over the last 
40 some years. I know a lot of those people. I went through the list. I highlighted every one that I actually know and remember. Um, I am incredibly uh, flattered to be part of that group. It is an interesting, interesting list of people. Um, and never did it occur to me that I've come to this event over the years. I've always appreciated this event. I've always thought it was a wonderful um, aspect of Muskegon life that, that we have this kind of event. And I've always liked it, so I've, I've been to a lot of them. Um, but it never occurred to me that you might put me in that category and put me in that company. So um, please know how much I appreciate that. I have some other people that I have to thank. Um, I want to thank my family and friends that are here tonight. My partner of almost 37 years, Charlene Romanowski, is here, and everyone who's ever been a community activist, a doer, a, someone with passion, someone trying to get stuff done, you know that you can't do it without those people in your life, without that life partner that's right there with you and, and willing to be a part of it. And you and Char, you and I, Char, have had a lot of good times working for, um, on behalf of Muskegon. Char's passion for education and for kids and for teachers rubbed me the right way every single day. I've learned much from the master teacher that you are, Char. Andy? Romanowski. My bonus son, for whom I will always be grateful, is here tonight. Thank you, Andy, for being here and for being such an important part of my life for over 36 years. Um, I love you. You know that. My daughter, Casey Hainer O'Connell, who is, as you all know with your children, my very heart is also here tonight. Um, you were just 19 months old, Casey, when we packed it up into a U-Haul you and me and a dog named Jesse, and moved to Muskegon in 1984. Um, as you were beginning to grow, it was really clear to me that I could only envision raising you in that environment that was normal to me, Michigan. Um, and Muskegon was the right place to come back to and to um, make a life here. And I hope that the love for this town and this place stays with you always, and that you're always proud of growing up here. And who knows, maybe someday you'll be back here. I'll never stop you. My sister Jill is here tonight. And talk about a gift, it's a whole other story, we're not gonna get into it tonight, but um, meeting you and being a part of this extended family that we've created with your children and our children um, and our grandchildren has been a gift that just keeps on giving. Um, I also wanna thank my oldest friend who's here tonight, Susan Close. Besides helping me get out of the house, I, I will not do crutches, I would kill myself. So it's like, I'm in a wheelchair and I can't get out of the house by myself. So besides getting me out of the house, where are you, Susan? There you are. Um, and getting me down that ramp, um, you have been the through line of my life for the last 50 years. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, without a doubt, my earliest and most important lessons in leadership were from you and have informed my career ever since. And I wouldn't have it any other way. What I love about this town, again, is you. It's the people in this audience. It's the people in Muskegon that give their, their treasure where their heart is, that are willing to see things and have vision and try to make things better in Muskegon. And the fact that we can do that. We can get together, we can reach out to each other, and we can make things happen. I love that about Muskegon. If the humanities are defined as the efforts that explore, strengthen, and expansively celebrate the stories, the histories, and cultures of the people in our community, if the humanities are those activities and pursuits which bring people together through stories, histories, cultures, conversations, in order to create a more thoughtful and connected, engaged, and informed citizenry, citizenry then indeed the humanities are the very heart of Muskegon that you have determined that I have been able to make those kinds of contributions to this community that I love so deeply is an honor I will treasure all the days of my life. Thank you.
Congratulations, Judy. Um, there's you were well, um, well deserved award, so that was very nice. Thank you. So now I'm going to call Bill Hogan, uh, brother of David, to come up and introduce him. Uh, this could be fun. <laughs> you know, I think I may have squandered an opportunity because I really could have even a few scores tonight, but I chose to be nice to you. But anyways, thank you all for being here. This is obviously an honor for our family. We're very excited for when and uh, looking forward to looking forward to your presentation and, and celebrating. Uh, one of the things that I've always said um, within my own family and, and that I believe in is if you can mix your passion and your career together, you're going to be a huge success. And when started out uh, at a very young age showing uh, an interest in history and a passion for history, and he's been able to combine that with his career. I think that's a wonderful thing. One thing that I do need to clarify uh, early on is, you know, they announced the, uh, the award for Wynn, and to many of us in Muskegon, Wynn is Wynn, he's not David Hogan. Because in our family, there was two David W. Hogans, and it was easier to call him Wynn uh, than David. So there's a few folks that had asked, did your dad get an award? Is it your father? And I said, no, I think, it, I think it's Wynn. So. Um, anyways, he started out at a very young age, um, you know, showing a, a real interest in history. And I, I remember when we were in, in grade school and just growing up, you know, mom and dad had built a home and in Wynn's room, were these shelving units, and he set up all these dioramas. Now they weren't just dioramas, they were authentic battles that he actually set up in his room. Now I would come home from school and actually knock them all over and set up my own battles, but, uh, uh, but no, he would, he would get very, very frustrated with me uh, with doing that. But the key to it was every morning when we were up and getting ready for school, uh, Wynn was always lecturing his little soldiers on, uh, in the dioramas. You know, he was either role-playing or, or doing an actual lecture or maybe being a general or whatever. But, so every morning I got to listen to his, uh, do his lectures. Uh, as he got older, in fifth grade, you know, most of us you know, struggled to, in fifth grade to write a one-page book report. Wynn did a 50-page dissertation <laughs> on some book on history. So I thought that was kind of a funny story. Um, and then later in sixth grade, uh, Don Walters was the uh, history teacher. And he said, you know, uh, Dave Hogan, I think you know more about the Civil War than I do. Why don't you go ahead and teach the class? So here's the sixth grader teaching his own class you know, uh, the, the subject of, uh, of the Civil War. Um, but the main thing that I remember, and Wynn will recall this as well, is that we used to go on many family vacations, and some of the family vacations were targeting his interest and my father's interest, and that was battlefield to us. And I hate to tell everybody this, a battlefield is essentially just a field of grass. <laughs> but we had to go to battlefields all day long. It was excruciating. And my sister and I, we just wanted to go to the hotel and go to the pool and swim and have fun. And no, we had to go to all these battlefields. But there was one occasion that I remember, um, and when was about 14, I think, at the time. And this is quite a while ago because they wouldn't do this today, but they allowed the tour guide to get in your car with you. And so the tour guide was sitting in the car. Well, this guy didn't realize he had just gotten ambushed. <laughs> here he's got a little 14 year old pipsqueak in the back seat correcting him as we went through the car. <laughs> but it was near the end of the trip that through the battlefield that he actually. Uh, 
uh, you know, I think he noticed the name tag and he said, so are you um, uh, related to General so-and-so? And the guy essentially pumped himself up again and I think he was in better shape at that point. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it's at that time, through all this whole phase, you know, my goal was to try to be different than my brother. I did not want to be my brother. <laughs> And I wanted to do everything, but be, you know, he studied all the time. He was a bookworm, and you know, I just wanted to. I wanted to be different. Unfortunately, when graduated from North Muskegon in 1976 as valedictorian of the class, I graduated seven years later with a C average, right smack in the middle of my class. <laughs> and I will tell you, when you graduate at that level, you've got a lot of catch-up work to do to try to get yourself squared around. So. So that kind of backfired on me. Um, he graduated in 76, he went off to Dartmouth College, and a lot of this stuff you can read through in the bios. Uh, and I think he kind of got ambushed himself because at Dartmouth, he's just one of many valedictorians going to school there. So he, he had to struggle a little bit, but he was able to graduate with honors in 1980. And he went off to Duke University and got a master's from Duke and a PhD from Duke University in 1986. Now, the, 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 this part of our lives, though, I was starting to appreciate my brother much more. I mean, it was, he was kind of a cool kid now. You know, he wasn't, we weren't going to battlefields anymore. <laughs> so, so it was a lot more, it was more fun to see him. And we got to go and visit him at college and it was, it was a lot of fun. So, uh, oh, I also need to mention he has written 14 different books that were all technically oriented. Only read them if you're trying to have a hard time going to sleep at night. <laughs> like I said, I'm trying not to get even. <laughs> so, um, but it wasn't until a trip in 2018. I took the kids and we went to Washington uh, to, to visit Wynn and his lovely wife Paige. And so we went there and they said, what would you like to do? And I said, hey, why don't we, we need to, we'd like to see the monuments. We'd like to tour the city. It's a wonderful city to visit. And uh, I said, why don't we go to Gettysburg? Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> Needless to say, Wynn thought I had three eyes. He's like, are you kidding me? You want to go to a battlefield? <laughs> and I said, you know, at this point, it was kind of, it was cool. It was neat. It was fun. And to watch him, he has so much passion. And the kids were just bug-eyed watching him. And then people at the battlefield started following us around. <laughs> because, hey, you just have the best tour guide available. So, um... Anyways, one thing about Gettysburg, I think if you go through that battlefield and you read every plaque, it takes you about a week to go through the whole thing. That's how big it is. It's a huge, huge battlefield. So later on, um, I wanted to kind of close. I think when had said to my mom at one point, you know, I don't understand why you named me when you should have named me lose because i feel like Luke, well he had probably just got to beat tennis by greg kaufman which is a normal affair and uh but i want you to know i think you're a winner It was hard getting through Gettysburg with your family, Bill, because I think Thomas desperately wanted to stay at Bell's Den. <laughs> Every time I go on a Gettysburg tour with the family, it's tough because uh, whenever the kids hit Devil's Den, they want to play on the rocks. Um, I have one correction. Uh, with Don Walters, that was 11th grade. <laughs> By that point, I was more than sure. Um, well, this is, uh, <laughs> this is really something, and uh, my compliments to Judith Hanger. I know my mom has worked with her for many times over the years, and uh, 
Ski Museum of Art is special. It really is. <laughs> I, when you go into the National Gallery of Art in Washington and you see an Edward Hopper painting that it's on loan from the Ski Museum of Art, <laughs> that is incredibly moving for somebody from this uh, from this area. That that was that was a thrill and. I wasn't sure for a while if a Tornado Over Kansas was indeed a classic or just what Mr. Stewart gave us an art class <laughs> because it was in the museum, but that has a lot of uh, uh, fame as well. It's kind of like This Is Your Life, which is, uh, when I look around, This Is Your Life. Which is, uh, actually, Omar Bradley did appear in This Is Your Life, but in later life, later in his life. Uh, and um, I hope that uh, Marty and Joe and all those good people who invited me uh, realized they were taking a calculated risk. <laughs> because 50 years ago, my mom asked me when we were on a trip around the Hudson uh, to tell her about what happened at West Point. And two hours later, she turned to me and said, you still haven't told me about West Point. <laughs> so I could be kind of loquacious, but I trust I won't keep you for two hours. By the way, I lost my first uh, job here in Muskegon at Madison Oldsmobile because it took me too long to watch wash each individual car. <laughs> I don't know if John can confirm that. But, um, no, uh, I have really had a privileged life in so many ways. Um, I was born on third base and I didn't hit a triple to get there. Um, I was not born in a log cabin that I built with my own hands. It was a very idyllic childhood. I had, in many ways, I had loving parents and, who were basically provided what I needed. I, didn't, I never really felt like we were rich necessarily, but certainly we had what we needed. And I also had parents who encouraged history once I discovered it at an early age. Uh, we took a lot of trips and yes, I remember Carolyn and Bill were not enthusiastic about those trips. But my dad, uh, well, he's, many of you know, he's very involved with the history club. He loves history, grew up with history, he always had a lot of books around. Um, he actually owns the copy of uh, Omar Bradley's A General's Life that I've used and borrowed permanently <laughs> uh, for my own work on Bradley. Um, part of the one way they encouraged my interest, I guess, uh, was when I was in, uh, we had just moved to North Muskegon, and we took a trip to Washington, D.C. at the end of March 1968. Now, if you were, um, now if you know your history and you remember, and certainly people of that age remember, uh, that was a rather eventful week in Washington, D.C. We got there at the start of the week, and Lyndon Johnson decided he was not going to run again for President of the United States. A few days later, my dad was, you know, we were noticing, you know, that the pe people in the hotel, we were had, had the restaurant seemed very subdued and very unhappy. And we didn't know the reason. And we found out the next morning that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. And when we got up the next morning in our hotel on Rhode Island Avenue, we saw National Guard trucks on their way up Rhode Island Avenue to Northeast Washington, which was on fire. Um, you guys did have a way of getting me into historical events, I must say. Um, my siblings, as Bill indicated, they barely tolerated it. Um, Carolyn Mount snuck off a tape I made of Civil War tapes, a Civil War songs, and taped over it with her sidekick in crime, Liz Monroe. Um, it's amazing Carolyn survived to adulthood. Um, Bill, was, uh, Bill was somewhat more normal and practical. He, uh, he talks about how, you know, his experience uh, being different. Well, I may have perhaps manipulated him to some extent because it ends up that I was doing the work I would like to do with homework and with uh, the Civil War and everything while he was the one who was taking care of the boat and some of the, some of the yard work and all that. But um, he, would, he would tag along in these history tours, but the only time he ever got excited was when he heard that we were going to stop by a battlefield called Mechanicsville. 
because he thought that had something to do with cars. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, something of a weird kid, strange kid growing up, I will admit. Um, I was probably the only first grader in the history of Hiles School to carry a briefcase. <laughs> um, I had black rim glasses, Henry Kissinger type glasses, all the way through high school. They'll vouch for that. I didn't get I didn't get wire rooms until I finally gave up in college. Um, I actually knew about the Holocaust fairly early. Um, there's a book up there on the How and Why book of World War II that came out when I was about four years old. And I remember there was a kid that uh, was going around. I said said to him, "Do you realize that the, this if you'd been World War II, you'd have been executed?" The kid's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't have liked to have faced his parents later on when they had to have the discussion. But um, my earliest memory was getting the World Bank Encyclopedias in 1962, and we were over in Rugmont. Um, I brought a, I was interested first in presidents and then in U.S. history, especially the Civil War. I brought, a, I still have a lot of those old books and I brought some of them along um, with me. I love the American Heritage Junior Histories. Um, we're inspired by another historian from West Michigan, Bruce Catton, who uh, ran the American Heritage, he was a senior editor of the American Heritage Company at the time. And I have never seen uh, books that are as great for kids in terms of learning history. Those were tremendous. And of course, I've been a lifelong admirer of Catton. Uh, who uh, lived in Benzon grew up in Benzonia and passed on on the shores of Crystal Lake um, about 50, almost 50 years ago. I was very patriotic. I was, uh, um, came from a somewhat patriotic family, and, and I didn't follow Vietnam as much, but I think it's pretty clear I would be classified a hawk looking back. I don't know, back in fourth grade we had those weekly readers and there was one, one weekly reader feature in 1968 which had a feature on all the individual presidents, or our presidential candidates. And I went over each one and crossed out, uh, crossed out McCarthy, you know, he's bad. That's doesn't like the war in Vietnam. Oh, Reagan, likes, Reagan supports the war in Vietnam. I went through each of those. Um, while others listened to Beatles, Steppenwolf, and the Doobie Brothers, I tended to like more patriotic songs. I remember there was a time when Wee Swickman asked me what, what uh, song I liked, and I said, The Testament of Freedom. And I wish I had a cell phone camera at the time because the look on his face was priceless. <laughs> Muskegon in the 60s and 70s was a very special place to grow up. Um, you, know, you get, this is the beauty of history, is you get very history conscious as you go along. And, um, you know, I'm not saying that everything in Muskegon in the 60s and 70s was hunky-dory. The paper mills smelled like crazy. We had all the dead alewives on the beach. We go down there, so we had that fishy smell. And of course, uh, dominating the landscape was the Frank Garber smokestack down at the end of Muskegon Lake, which one of our classmates, uh, yeah, he actually did climb it at one point when the guards weren't looking. Um, but it was a um, time it can get pretty nostalgic about because at that time we figured we had won every war. We were, we were 10 and 0, as Bill Murray would say. And, um, and uh, it was really Muskegon's heyday, 60s and 70s, and the early 70s. Uh, we knew we were the best comp country in the world. Um, times were good. It's true the Congressional Almanac dumped on us, called us a grimy industrial town on the shores of Lake Michigan. But, um, but it was a special time and a special place, and my parents' circle of friends, and sad so many of them are gone now. But um, they were wonderful people, um, executives, philanthropists, in the spirit of Charles Hackley. And, uh, and if you were from Muskegon, they were sportsmen. They, they got out and they did things. Um, invented snurfers for crying out loud. Um, as for high school, it was a crazy time. <laughs> it was a crazy time to be going to high school. Uh, and for school administrators and parents, um, I will just say there was a lot of experimentation, which I was only very vaguely aware of. 
I, that's probably true of most generations, but but um, I was not cool, so I, I managed to be away. From, I managed to be away from a lot of that. Uh, the mock elections were kind of reflective. I was most scholastic, most shy, and teacher's pet. <laughs> My colleague with the uh, teacher's, teacher's pet is here today, Patty Pansy, so. <laughs> I got to re yep, revisit that when Joe took me over to the old Norton Stevie yearbooks that were in Torrent House. But um, I concluded fairly early, though, that I needed to get into sports um, there because uh, when you were at North Muskegon, that, that's how you got stats, if you were, if you were a sportsman jock. And, uh, and that was a time when you could do three sports in a year. Now, sports are so professionalized. Heck, I think Thomas plays soccer year-round, practically. So, back then, you did football in the fall, you did wrestling in the winter, and you did tennis in the spring. And you could do all those things without uh, all the travel programs and things like that. If you had asked me in the late, early 70s, I probably would have said I wanted to go to West Point. Um, Greg Moore was there uh, from Muskegon. Um, he, was, he was a cadet. Uh, it, was thrilling, it was thrilling to meet him. Uh, but my parents had four more years to work on me. It was not a, good, not a real nice time to go into the military. So by 76, I was thinking I'd be a lawyer. Then I went to Dartmouth, and as Bill said, suddenly found out I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. Um, and I wasn't into the beer scene there. The, the beer scene was very big there. But I did meet this professor, Rowena Reed, who uh, one of, certainly one of the foremost influential people in my life. Um, I took her Civil War seminar, and she encouraged me to go into history. Of course, I was then, at that point imbued by my father, who can't make a living in history. And uh, she's like, no, there are a lot of government jobs. You can, you can, there, are, there are ways you can get jobs. And sure enough, I had the opportunity to go to Duke, which at the time had a reputation as the best military history program in the country. Take that, Ohio State. And uh, did, a, did my dissertation on the Army's Rangers. Um, I went to Center of Military History in the fall of 1987, so I've been there for 35 some years. They wanted World War II specialists at the time because they were losing so many, so they kind of steered me in that direction, and that's how I started writing probably my big book to this point, the First Army Headquarters, and that's where I became interested in Omar Bradley. There still isn't, in my view, a really good biography of him. It's, it's been a great ride. Um, met a lot of uh, met a lot of interesting people, um, including uh, when I was here, I met Rosa Parks. For the, when they had that exhibit, uh, I Have a Dream, I think it was called, and she was here. And I also, when I was studying First Army, met Strom Thurmond. So I kind of feel I covered the spectrum <laughs> in terms of views on race. One of the most interesting guys I ran into, though, was uh, Wally Strobel. Um, and I did that at the 50th anniversary, um, the 50th anniversary of D-Day. A good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Ted Wilson at the University of Kansas, invited me to the 50th observation out at the Eisenhower Center in Abilene, Kansas. Um, most people can't understand my affection for Abilene, Kansas, but, but um, I absolutely love it there. It's so Midwest. And, um, and there I got a chance to meet a fellow I'd never forgotten. Do you people remember that picture of Eisenhower before D-Day talking to a paratrooper? It's a very famous picture. Um, he, well, that paratrooper he was talking to was Lieutenant Wallace Strobel of Saginaw, Michigan. And uh, he's featured in Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation. He parachuted into Normandy after that talk with Eisenhower. And Wally told me, he said, he later became very successful insurance salesman and uh, owner, part owner of the Saginaw Years, for those of you who remember the hockey teams. And uh, he told me that Eisenhower was all, he was coming in, he was always looking for somebody from Kansas. You know, who's, yeah. And he said to Wally, he said, where are you from? And Wally said, I'm from Michigan. Oh, good fishing in Michigan. <laughs> and then he keeps going back. <laughs> but, but for that brief moment, the camera, the camera was snapped and Wally became history. Um, 
Now I'm working on the 250th anniversary of the revolution for the center. We're, kind of, we're heading a program that's preparing the Army's monograph series that we're putting together for that. And so in a way I can say my career has come full circle since I graduated with the class of 76 and we had the bicentennial graduation speech. So very, uh, very interesting how, the, how life turns and how that all comes out. Needless to say, I've got a lot of pride in, in Muskegon and in Michigan. My family and I come back every summer in August, and we've spent several holiday seasons there. I'll tell you one thing, everybody at CMH knows where I'm from. I don't keep it any secret. I keep that Michigan, that Blue and Maze Michigan stencil in the transom of my door. And uh, when they say they walk into Hogan's office, you're walking into the Michigan zone. I've got, I've got paintings by Karen Fefke. I've got enough lighthouse pictures to beat the band. And a bunch of Michigan paraphernalia on the walls that I use to uh, bother the numerous Ohio State fans that are, that are working in that office. Um, lot, um, I follow the Tigers, the Lions, Michigan, Michigan State very, very uh, closely. I'm always looking at the news and free press online for the latest results. My dad tried to keep me from a life of pain over the Detroit Lions. <laughs> you know, come out here and break leaves. <laughs> You're wasting your time. Those of you who are from around here know that in Michigan there are two types of people in Michigan. There are Lion fans, and there are those who make fun of Lions fans. <laughs> you would have thought I'd be from Michigan State given my mom's pedigree as a Michigan State grad, but then came November 22nd, 1969. The greatest upset in, in college football history, and I've been an amazing blue follower pretty much ever since, although I still wish Michigan State well when they're not playing Michigan. Um, I followed this community. I grieved over there were two people, two uh, young men who uh, died in Iraq. One played at Oak Ridge High School, and one played at Hart. One was in the Army, and one was in the Marines. And I sometimes wonder if they played on the same fields I did. I owe so much to this community, and I also want to thank my uh, wife, Paige. There have been a lot of bumps along the road, but uh, she's been with me through all of it, and didn't hurt when we were dating that she's a direct descendant of Hugh Mercer, who was a hero of the Revolutionary War. <laughs> but believe it or not, I found that out later. That was not my primary motivation. Okay. You guys came to hear less about me and more about Omar Bradley. Um, unless you get too alarmed that this lecture is taking too long, I will be spending most of it on my boy on his boyhood as its title would indicate, the son of the Midwest. Okay, let's see, Joe. Um, let me advance this. Hmm. You put use this to advance it? <laughs> oh, no, no. Okay, use, use the laptop. Yeah, sorry. Okay, <laughs> use the arrows. You guys have to remember, um, I was the, uh, Bottom finisher in the high school shop class. <laughs> I, think I, I think I wore out Ronald Jansen's complete supply of wood trying to square a board. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Which was the, uh, which was the starting point. So, each of us according to our abilities. So, in any case, who was Omar Nelson Bradley? Um, we have various pictures of him. Um, Bradley at D-Day. Uh, there we go. That's, uh, there's a similar scene in the movie, The Longest Yard, but that's him on D-Day. That's him with his uh, two pet was, uh, George Patton, with his silk girl handed social gun on his head. And uh, Bernard Law Montgomery, the imperialist commander of the British 21st Army Group. Uh, he was one of World War II's titans. 
He was immensely popular. Um, only MacArthur, Eisenhower, and Marshall had more stature in the late 40s and 50s. He was the man in the field, the field architect of the Army's victory in World War II. You often, in Europe during World War II, you would uh, often hear he commanded more ground troops than anybody in the, else in the history of, a, of the U.S. Army, about 1.3 million. I think you start to get into semantics there, where, you know, wasn't Eisenhower com commander over Bradley? Yes. His, but he also had an extensive career beyond World War II, and we'll talk about that some. He was head of the Veterans Administration, Army Chief of Staff, the first chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Korean War. Some of you served under him. And uh, he was very important in writing the limited war strategy that became so controversial in the course of the 50s and 60s. Um, he was a national icon into the 1980s, long after leaving the service. After Eisenhower's death, he was probably the biggest World War II hero we had left until his death in 1981. And no one trumpeted his performance more than his West Point classmate, Eisenhower. Eisenhower in 1943 wrote to George Marshall, Bradley is about the best rounded, well-balanced senior officer that we have in the service. His judgments are always sound, and everything he does is accomplished in such a manner as to fit well with all other operations. He is respected by British and Americans alike. Uh, at the end of the war, he wrote Bradley, in my opinion, you are preeminent among the commanders of major battle units in this war. Um, and in 1967, he wrote, I really believe that Bradley was the finest field commander we had in World War II. Not Patton, not, not Hodges or Devers or Patch or any of those Simpson or any of those other names, Omar Bradley. But why should Muskegon care? What, what connection does he have to Muskegon? Well, if you kind of go along Muskegon Lake here and you think of the World War II sites, we have the Silver Sides over here. We have the LST. And the LST, uh, I keep saying, that, that ship, you have to look at, that was essential. That was the ship that many ways won World War II because you could, you could land on a, on a hostile shore and build up power much faster with these boats, that could, that these ships that could just roll tanks and vehicles right off the front. Um, at one point, Prime Minister Churchill himself said the destiny of two empires seemed to be writing some goddamn things called LSTs. <laughs> but, uh, but it goes beyond that with Muskegon. Muskegon was a major component of the arsenal of democracy during World War II. Tens of thousands flocked to Muskegon to work in the war plants, uh, worked 48-hour weeks, 2,000 women been listed as in this area were building engines and tanks um, in, the, in the various factories around Muskegon. We have ration boards, rationing boards distributing gas, tires, tubes. Um, and in a way that in a way, neat way that kind of still lasts in the sense that today we have this company called L3 Techs Technology <coughs> Combat Propulsions makes transmissions for the Army's fighting vehicle infantry, which is known as the Bradley. So we still have a connection there on the old Continental site. But the connection with Muskegon goes farther. In 1911, a young lad named Herman Bukema left Muskegon to uh, attempt to join the class of 1915, the class the stars fell on. He lived on 132 Myrtle Street, right over here just toward Apple Avenue. His nickname was Dutch. He was, I guess he was from Western Michigan, so they had to call him Dutch. <laughs> he was a track star in the half mile. Um, they, they said that he liked, that he felt the Dutch company is the best company, was, was his uh, nom de guerre. He went to infantry, and he was a classmate of both Bradley and Eisenhower, class of 1915, the class the stars fell on, the most famous class in the history of West Point. And he became a profess famous professor of social sciences at West Point, famous geopolitician known throughout the country. Um, the class secretary wrote that, that uh, Herman Bukema had the most influence of any person in the history of West Point since Sylvania Thayer, who was basically the guy who found him. But there's more to it, the connection than that. They knew each other, obviously, as classmates, but the connection runs deeper. 
Bradley had one daughter, Elizabeth. Herman had his son, Buc uh, Hank Buchanan. And uh, they met. Uh, during the war years, Elizabeth was going to school at Vassar. He was at West Point. On June 8, 1944, they were married. And uh, so he married, so Hank Buchanan married Bradley's only daughter. It was June 8, 1944. The, the bride's father couldn't make the wedding. He had some other, <laughs> he had some other business in Normandy. Um, unfortunately, Hank was killed in a plane crash during the Korean War. Uh, that was a test experimental jet. But they had three kids, and those kids are, are descended from both Omar Bradley and Herman Bukema of Mesquite, Michigan. And that's Herman, and that's Herman Bukema's class photo right there next to Bradley's. This is the guy that made uh, Omar Bradley famous. Guy on the right, Ernie Pyle, the famous war correspondent, Pulitzer Prize winner, made his name writing about the ordinary GI. Well, in the spring of 1943, reporters were starting to discover Bradley. And you had, oh, at the time it seemed like MacArthur and Patton were getting all the attention. And uh, Eisenhower and Marshall felt that Bradley was a good person to build up because he was, more mo he was more modest, a team player, it seemed like more of a model. And in May 43, Eisenhower kind of nudged Pyle and said, you know, you really need to discover Bradley, Omar Bradley. Uh, Bradley, at least ostensibly, said, I'm not interested in the publicity, I'm not interested in the PR, I just try to do my job. But he had a push from within his staff, uh, Captain or Major Chet Anson, who was next to him there in that picture, had met Chet Anson, interesting guy. He, uh, he was a Syracuse journalism major, and he understood reporters. And he pointed out to Bradley, he said, uh, you know, all these Americans are gonna be curious about who's commanding their boys, and you owe it to them to, to be, be with Pyle. Well, Pyle hung out, Pyle, so Bradley played along, Pyle hung out for a few days at Bradley's Second Corps headquarters in Sicily. He got a lot of teasing from his fellow correspondents for hanging out with the brass. But, uh, and Pyle came away absolutely fascinated with Bradley. And he built up, great admirer, he built up this image in his columns back to Scripps Howard, back to the States. He found that he was, he loved his folksy ways, his Missouri twang, his dress like a common soldier, his air of being a school teacher, yet he was also a great sportsman and a crack rifle shot. Pyle said his conversation was not brilliant or unusual, and he's still at the Middle West in his vocabulary. He used expressions like fighting to beat the band and a horse of another color. There was absolutely no pretense about him and he hated ostentation. I make no bones about the fact that I'm a tremendous admirer of General Bradley. I don't believe I've ever known a person to be so unanimously loved and respected by the men around and under him. This is the image Bradley wanted, the image that we've come away with, the, the, the homespun, unpretentious, competent professional who cared deeply about his soldiers. But is that all to the story of Omar Bradley? As I discussed with my wife, this is the complicated part of the speech. <laughs> As I'm trying to talk about some basic concepts. Um, Bradley is a Midwesterner. Bradley would later say on his, about his boyhood home, that's where I learned the values by which I tried to live. And that brings a chord in the sense that uh, being from the Midwest, we think of the Midwest as the heartland the center of American manufacturing and agriculture, the breadbasket of the nation. And we have this legend, this view of our of Midwest values, of this, of Midwesterners as down-to-earth, friendly, patriotic people who take pride in themselves as the repository for traditional American values. Now, my wife being from Bethesda, Maryland, we get into these discussions a little bit about this. Um, and it's true. Some of, you know, many of these values are not unique to the Middle West. Some of them we tend to identify more with 
country with rural. Um, and in, even in the 1890s, these, these are qualities that are, get a lot of respect among Americans at the time. In 1900, of course, you had, it was more of a rural bent to these myths. Um, this is the ad you have of the Hardy Yeoman in a Grange, in a Grange of Agricultural Associ Association image at the time. Cities were growing, but most Americans still lived on their farms and small towns, more isolated surroundings. Still not, not that much difference between rich and poor at that time in these small communities. Life was simpler and slower. But there were certain norms, certain, certain values that were in these communities. Uh, it was an age of Victorian notions. Um, strong religious underpinning. The notion that life has a purpose, that progress is inevitable. Some of these are things that have been challenged in the last so many years. And the key element of character, you define a man by his character, how, how he is, a man's fitness. A lot of it comes from this pietistic Christian morality, Judeo-Christian morality, of the qualities of self-reliance, honesty, trust, benevolence toward one's fellow man, thrift, and the ability to work hard and contribute to one's family and community, then these are the qualities that make you successful. Some of it stems from Thomas Jefferson's agrarian ideal, idealization of the farmer. It's the independent, thrifty, energetic yeoman you know, that made sure that, democracy, that wealth is distributed in a democratic way. The farmer is the republic's anchor in the seat of virtue. And of course, the belief in the United States as a land of opportunity where even those born in humble circumstances could lift up themselves. Um, part of this is the belief in the frontier. The American is, and the frontier was huge in this period. The American is a European settler shaped by the wilderness into a tough, resourceful, manly individual. Who, who's idolized in this period? People like Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses Grant, at least in the North. And uh, Daniel Boone, who's big in the uh, culture that Bradley grew up in. The problem is, when you get into the early 20th, the 1890s, this is, uh, this is not what people are seeing. I don't know how many of you folks remember the old Pabst Blue Ribbon ads where everybody's in, you know, the ladies in their big hoop skirts playing croquet, and everybody's having a nice time in the gay 90s. The 90s weren't so gay. Um, a lot more Americans lived in towns like Higby, Missouri. These are pictures of Higby, Missouri in 1910, agricultural community, coal mining community. Um, rural life is getting to Gradually, even though most Ameri more Americans still live in the country than in small towns, rural life is going down in prestige, seen as smug, socially backward, and intellectually confining. And so they're facing this kind of questioning from, from culture, from society, and they have this series of, you think we're having problems now, you look at the 1890s, and some of the problems that come up, um, Panic of 1894, the worst depression in American history to that time. And it hits farmers especially hard. Uh, farmers, a lot of the thing with American farmers is that they're so good at what they do, they overproduce, which causes prices to fall. And you combine that with the increasing cost of equipment, the lack of the inability to get credit, um, the uncertainties of weather, and also the Farmers of the 1890s felt squeezed by the prohibitive rates of the grain elevators and the railroads. They were charging out the wazoo. And you didn't have any other way to get your stuff to market, get your product to market. Consequently, they seemed to be falling, far, working harder than ever, only to fall farther behind. Um, and this has a lot of social consequences. Um, the demand for expansion of the currency for easier credit, to the point that the silver issue, old William McKinley who stands looking over Hackley Park over here, that was his big issue. Coin, you know, don't coin silver. Uh, that's gonna just create inflation and ruin the currency. Um, 
But we also had rise of immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe. Segregation and Jim Crow were on the rise. Rising demand for women's rights, the new woman, challenging traditional Victorian roles. Of course, I remember when your mom used to say that, uh, I don't think women should be equal, I think women are superior. <laughs> sure you heard that one. Um, but the idea was that women no longer were just confined to cooking, cleaning, and childcare, but they could seek adventure in other spheres while maintaining traditional roles. That was always the key. After all, I couldn't expect men to do that. Um, 1890 was a key date for the closing of the frontier. You know, you have the ideology of the frontier so central to the American psyche. There's no longer that outlet for a fresh start if you're having trouble with, job, with uh, making ends meet. You're losing a key component of U.S. identity. And this figures into what we could call the crisis of masculinity. That uh, is this, is American society without the frontier turning increasingly urban, is it becoming over-civilized, too effete? Men, turning men too soft. You know, Theodore Roosevelt's your guy for this one. The strenuous life. And he, he, was, he kind of served as the anecdote. Ane, ane, anecdote. Anecdote. That's what it means. Um, and you have all this psychic unrest, which contributes to um, foreign adventures, the Spanish-American War, the Philippine War, the New Empire. Um, this fear of losing spiritual qualities for the temptations of materialism. Um, age of temperance crusades, progressive movement reforms, and some people just try to escape through amusement parks and, and, and fairs and circus and baseball and horse racing. Very interestingly, there's also a fascination with money. Now remember, this is the 1890s and 1800s, and you don't have the government regulation you would have later. And there's a, you have this idea that you get, you get successful through hard work. You put in the hard work, successful. But this is also the age of the con man. One of my favorite movies, The Music Man, set in River City in 1910. Um, and in the Midwest, this comes in the form of it's, it's beautifully portrayed in this. You can have this surf, surface friendliness, but, um, but underneath you're watching out. You, know, you never know for sure. This is, um, you don't want to be taken for a sucker. Show me Missouri. Um, it's no accident. You know, Dwight Eisenhower, his father got taken when he was a kid. Well, actually before he was a kid, just before. Uh, his father owned his store. And uh, at, in Abilene, Kansas, co owned a store with this guy who cleaned him out and ran off with the cash. And um, the poor guy, David Eisenhower, had to go down to Texas to recoup his fortunes, which is where Eisenhower was born, and then they moved back to Abilene. But Eisenhower's mother reminded her six kids you know, always be out on the lookout for those chiselers, those cheats that are going to swindle you. Underlying this, underlying this Midwestern amity is a certain amount of uh, watch out. But, there's also, but it also figures into this business. Does virtue still spell success? That brings us to Omar and his family. Omar is from north central Missouri, Randolph County. I think it's more accurate actually to say he's from Randolph County than he is from Oberly because he moved around so much. Um, oops, let's see here. Randolph County, if you, in, if you went up there at the time, it was a lot of subsistence farms and mines, and one big railroad town called Moberly. And uh, subsistence farms aren't very capacious. You know, they used to call it scratching coal dust. Uh, Bradley was born there in southeastern Randolph County and Lincoln's birthday, 1893. His parents are interesting. Um, now I'll tell you, I find this guy 
just about as impressive as I find Bradley. Omar, John Smith Bradley, largely self-educated. I don't think he even read until he was 17 years old. But by 19, he was a school teacher. And he, uh, he, got, he was just, he's one of these guys who's tired of farming and he, he was ambitious. And he became a rural school teacher. He taught school for $40 a month. If you look at photos of him, you don't see as much of it in this picture, but he's built like a battleship. He looks like he's been lifting hay bales for a while. And today, he's, he's, uh, he's popular among a lot of these rural schools because he's the one guy who can keep the farm kids in line <coughs> with those one inch thick switches. Back in the days, you could use switches in high school. In school. He was also a baseball player, a hunter, and had some interest in politics. He was part of this populist movement among farmers, but not really an agitator. And Bradley worshipped him. Uh, Bradley said later he had integrity, a sense of justice, sobriety, patriotism, piety, calm, and thoughtful. We don't, unfortunately, as often happens with a woman of the era, we don't know as much about Bessie. Um, she was only 17 when she had Omar. Very young, prematurely gray. Omar described her as strict, attentive, unfailingly cheerful and resourceful and a superb cook, although when he described the kinds of dishes she fixed, like frog legs and uh, yum yum. Uh, but, but I'll take his word for it. Uh, that supposedly is Omar's toddler clothing. And uh, he was, for most of his boyhood, he was an only child. Uh, he had two nieces who lived with the family for lengthy periods, and he briefly had a brother. Uh, he, but he was an only child, and sometimes with only children, they, they, get, they get so much of the attention and so much of the hopes. And that seems to have been the case with Bradley. I mean, this, this was a poor family. John was always looking for ways to earn more money. And he hunted game for me. Well, a few years back, now I've got to warn you on um, another thing. I know my dad's slideshows are legendary. <laughs> so, uh, so believe it or not, one, once again you're subjected to a David Hogan slideshow. But we'll try to keep this moving along. In October 2014, I went to Randolph County. And um, this is Clark, Missouri, a uh, small crossroads town in the southeast part of the county. Bradley was born three miles west of there. And there seems to have been some local uncertainty about where exactly he was born. But I finally found this guy, Dale Chisholm, Korean War veteran. I think he was in Korea about the same time you were. And uh, so he says, I'll take you to the Bradley birthplace. And uh, I've been told he's the one I had it right. Okay, so, so we went out along this two track into this game preserve. And he stops by this patch of woods with nothing to indicate. A thumb marker, nothing there, and said, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, one tree looks like another. Um, and he took me back and he showed me the foundations, the Texas foundations, and I said, don't walk over there. And he said, I said, why? He said, it's an open well. You go down there and nobody finds you for a long time. <laughs> but um, that was the log cabin of Bradley's maternal grandparents, where he was born. Now, the Bradleys moved around southern Randolph County and, Howard, and Howard, adjacent Howard counties quite a bit. They'd go for one or two years, and he'd teach in these primitive rural one-room schoolhouses. This is, that's the site of Pemberton School. You can kind of get an idea of, right, of the rolling country, the woods here and there. Um, the upper, that's Burton, Missouri, just over the Howard County line on the right. That's, a, that's just a little train crossroads. That store right there, and the railroad stop, and not much, not much else. Locust Grove School was, you know, they lived in a dirt floor cabin there. So this guy, this guy did not, these guys did not have much money. 
The one place that is preserved is, is the Baldridge School, which is right there. And that has a rock with a Bradley plaque on it on the outside. Um, it was tough. Families saw more use for kids helping out with the farm chores than they did with a formal education. And a single teacher could supervise a span of ages from 6 to 20. Uh, some of those teachers knew a little more than the kids did. But Jan, John Bradley was uh, encouraged kids to read. He created small libraries for them. Um, and he could be a disciplinarian when he had to. At one point, a couple of students were coming off him with, after him with, with wood. And uh, Bradley said, oh, John Bradley said, oh, I guess I got to fight fire with fire. And he picks up a big chunk of wood and knocks them both upside the head. <laughs> they went running back to their parents. and. Uh, they, after talking to Mr. Bradley, they understood, although one of the kids on said he was going to shoot Mr. Bradley on sight. At that point, Mr. Bradley moved to another school. <laughs> but, uh, things could be tough. He was really into sports, Omar was. He walked one to, he'd walk up to two miles a day to school with his father and taught him about nature and arithmetic. This is a field on which he played baseball outside of Higby. Higby's in southwest Missouri, on the other side of Randolph County from Clutter. And that's the field. Omar would spend a lot of days, they'd play baseball outside, and then they'd go and hunt and fish elsewhere. Sports becomes a central part of his identity. And I don't know if it's just my impressionism or what, but it seems like sports is a huge, has become a huge part of Midwest culture. His father took him hunting and fishing, began going into the woods with his father at age four, where he received him, and received him, his own pump-action BB rifle at age six. And at age eight, he had a 22 caliber Stevens rifle to hunt squirrels and rabbits. He became an excellent shot, a lifelong bird hunter. He loved his dogs and his firearms. And he became quite a baseball player, too. Powerful arm. You do, I, I don't know how many people here have played baseball, but you do this thing called long toss, where you stretch out over a distance and just work throwing long distance. They, they'd go over by the railroad to Higby, and they'd have these stations, these concrete stations that are along the tracks, which were about 100 yards apart. His cousin would stand in one, he'd stand in the other, and they'd practice long toss. And he, he built up a powerful shoulder with that. This is a time when sports is really emerging in the American imagination. You know, if you lived earlier, you got enough of a workout just with everyday living without worrying about sports. But hey, if you want to be, if you want to be a real, real man, you had needed a sound mind and a sound body. And that, uh, that drives a lot of what's going on in this period with Bradley. That, it's an enormous source of confidence to him. Higby, which they moved to about 1902 or so, that's, that's how it looks today. You saw the photos earlier. That, there's, there's a main street with a lot of boarded up storefronts. Um, that's Bradley's church over there on the right. Um, they told me that's his house, because that's the same house that he lived in, in Higby. And that used to be the site of where the, where the school was that he, that he attended. Higby in the 1890s was a boom town, very prosperous with coal mines and railroad junction, and had a lot of brick business houses, opera house, uh, even oil street lights, new brick and stone sidewalks. John Bradley was able to get his the only son in the high school there, which is supposed to be a pretty good high school, while well, he hiked six miles to his new school um, on the other side of town. The Bradleys were regular churchgoers. They attended the Church of Christ in Higby. The way they were trying to, still trying to make money, they ran a telephone switchboard out of their house. Um, and Bradley did very well at school. He was he, he ranked at the top of his class. Uh, good at everything but writing and grammar. Um, however, he was no stranger to tragedy. At age eight, he lost his only sibling, uh, a little boy named Raymond at age 19. Um, and you read the obituaries from the Higby newspaper at the time, and I can't tell you just how you can sense the pain, the sense of loss, that he had and the struggle for acceptance that you see in this obituary that they could, they could lose him. But things got even worse later. In January 1908, 30th January 1908, John Bradley died 
after catching a cold and walking back from his school. He developed pneumonia and died on 30 January 1908, just weeks shy of his 41st birthday. Um, enormous blow, obviously, to his family and to the community, all kinds of, of word in the newspaper. There's a signal poignant entry in the Higby newspaper at that point of when they're talking to Omar's mother, and they spelled it wrong. They called him Homer at that time. But they said, uh, Homer's mother just wants to get her boy in a good school. You know, they, they lived for their son. And I guess you could see why. <laughs> but anyway, that Bradley is 15 when he moves to Moberly. And he they just bob around to a series of residences. There's one, there's another on the other side of town, there's another. Uh, Bessie had no estate. She had a heavy mortgage on the house back in Higby and a meager income from the phone company. She basically made a living as a seamstress to make ends meet. Um, Moberly at that time was a moderately good-sized city, population 10,923, was known as the Magic City. It was a railroad town, the hub for the Wabash Railroad and also the Brown Shoe Factory. Um, it was noted for its beautiful frame reference, re residences, its shady lawns, libraries, churches, schools, fairs, religious revivals. Moberly Signals semi-pro baseball team. Um, so this was, this was really a case of Omar moving to the big city. Well, maybe not the big city, but a city, certainly a city compared to the rural environment he was from. Um, that's the old Moberly Public School. It's now a condemned building, but, but uh, originally it was painted yellow brick, built in 1895. And when he moved to Moberly, Omar was a poor, shy country kid who had lost his dad, and he had no friends, and he had to repeat the 10th grade. Uh, but his ability in sports played a big part in his acceptance. He was, and, and it contributed to his emerging identity. He did both baseball and track. That's um, Omar right there in the middle. You can kind of see the jaw. Um, he was strong with his studies. He, he showed that he won his place by showing his ability. He was quiet, conscientious, and smart, very smart. He still has to work hard outside school to support his family and save money for college. Uh, not much of a social life. Uh, after a year, though, they figured out he was smart enough and they moved him back a year, so he ended up graduating with his, with his age and more importantly with Mary Quayle, more than that later. Um, this is the Central Christian Church in Moberly, one of the leading churches in town. Um, I have learned that it's very hard for me to characterize the religious beliefs of other denominations. All I can really say on the Church of Christ is their emphasis on returning to the basic teaching of the Bible as a guide for living. Omar and his mother were regular attendees, and indeed, uh, Omar was baptized by immersion in February 1909 when he was 16. Interestingly, Bradley later denied that he was especially religious, and to that extent, he was, kind of, he was more of a rational, logical kind of, he, uh, he, like Lincoln, he kind of reacted against what Lincoln would have called enthusiasms. He was not emotional. But he admitted to a feeling, to a feeling of destiny, which got uh, deepened at times like when he ran over an Italian landmine in Tunisia in his Jeep that didn't explode. He had a simple, calm faith that matters would somehow work out. He stayed a member of this church into the 1960s, even though he had lived elsewhere. And, these, and whatever his religious views, he took very seriously the values of Christian humility, kindness to others. Uh, he was a non-smoker, and uh, he did eventually develop a fondness for a drink after work, before dinner, but uh, he was a fairly mild drinker. And that partly was, I'm sure, due to his wife. Um, across the street from the Bradleys and Moberly lived Mary Quayle, the Quails. Like the Bradleys, smart, ambitious, with little money, 
and suffering from the premature death of a father. Charles Quayle was the chief of police in Moberly, a respected citizen before his premature death in November of 1902. But uh, he had some, there were some rumors in town, you know, the West towns can get sometimes, uh, rumors that he was a pretty heavy drinker. And uh, that may have contributed to Mary's strong temperance views. She, uh, she'd turn you off in a hurry if she smelled alcohol on you. Uh, still, though, for the most part, she was, an, she was a sweet, likable girl with a horror of fleas. Um, she wanted to go to Europe. She, she was like a lot. You know, want to get out and see the world. Wanted to go to Europe. She had a lot of literary interests and played the piano, and she was heavily involved in youth activities in the Central Christian Church. Uh, her mother was a Sunday school teacher for her in Omar. So, she had a bow when Bradley first showed up at, uh, showed up at Moberly, but over time, um, they became more attached. For a time, Bradley graduates from high school in 1910, and for a time it seems like he's going nowhere. He works for the Wabash Railroad for a time, doing supply work and repairing steam engines. And he's trying to earn enough to go to the University of Missouri, but he's not getting very far at it. And his mother remarried at Christmas 1910, and Omar didn't think much of his new stepfather, John Maddox. But on a Sunday in the spring of 1911, his Sunday school superintendent advises Omar to apply to West Point. Omar says, well, I, I couldn't afford that. No, Omar, it's free. You, know, you can get a free education there. And Bradley's like, oh, that looks like something worth investigating. He takes the exam at Jefferson Barracks, crams like crazy. The railroad's nice enough to give him a ticket down to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis. And uh, he gets stymied on a particular section, and he's about to walk out on the exam when you notice the, proc the proctor is kind of engaged in conversation, it's otherwise engaged. And Bradley just sits down and thinks for a bit, and then the answers start coming to him. Uh, thank goodness for the future of the U.S. Army. Um, he, the congressman says he has another candidate he favors, but that primary candidate flunks. And Omar gets the appointment as a supplementary appointment and shows up at West Point in August 1911. Now he struggles at first with academics, but he turns it around, particularly in mathematics. He had a great mathematical mind. Interestingly, he didn't have such a great rating of marksmanship. They graded all the cadets for marksmanship, and he was so-so. He blamed the rifles, said they were obsolete. Probably knew his rifles. But he was kind of a sports legend, particularly at baseball. He was known for having a rocket arm. I think his junior year, he had a 383 batting average. Admittedly, this is the dead ball era, but still pretty good. And um, there's a story that when they were playing Tufts, Tufts had a runner at third base with one out, one out I think, and a guy hits a deep fly to left field where Bradley's playing. And Tufts' guy kind of just tags up, oh yeah, this will be easy, he goes trotting home, and the ball's waiting for him. <laughs> that was a throw that got a lot of comments. Um, he was a backup center in football behind an All-American who later claimed he became an All-American because Bradley subs for him in the Army-Navy game and did a great job. But he was part of that jock crowd. Again, sports, his identity. And after a slow start, he turned it around into merits. He did very well in the merits. Unlike Eisenhower, he accepted the, the, hazard, the uh, disciplinary system. Eisenhower was always looking for ways to get around it smoking or sneaking into the mess hall to grab some ice cream. That wasn't Bradley's style. He ends up 44th of 164, well respected. Others expected him to be the first general, first to make general. He found a home at West Point. He loved everything about West Point. He became a believer in sports developing leadership. and He loved math, so he fit in well in that respect. And he just moved into a military career and never left it. It fit him like a glove. Here you get over some, we'll just skim over his period in the interwar period. Um, 
In Butte, Montana, he, uh, he likes to portray himself as sympathetic to the common man. Well, there were some miners striking in Butte, in Butte Montana during, the, during World War I, and Bradley gave them the subversives and cracked down on them. He engaged in, engaged in some activities which were borderline not so legal for an army officer. Um, but he thought he was fighting subversives that had infiltrated the labor movement. Um, in the interwar years, the interwar army put a lot of emphasis on schools, and that and Bradley shown in that regard. Um, as a student, he was second in his class at the infantry school, first at the command and general staff school, and he was also an instructor, a great teacher. He taught ROTC like many officers did at that time. He taught math at West Point, and later he was a tactical officer. He had that considerable patience and understanding and the ability to speak <coughs> concisely on complex topics. Some historians dismissed him as a great mediocrity, but you know, how did we end up with this guy running things in World War II? But the point is that he did not come out of nowhere. He had a lot of respect in the interwar army. Uh, he was well respected by several officers. He had glowing efficiency reports, which quoted him as quiet, forceful, excellent judgment, clear thinker, balanced, common sense. He continued his, in, his image as an athletic he-man. Um, he would pitch for his unit team against locals when the army, when his unit would put together a baseball team to play a local team. He did very well with that. He did so well that later when he was at the Army War College, they prohibited him from pitching. He was an outstanding golfer. He made the Army finals in the 1920s. Um, one of his colleagues, Floyd Parks, said that he was trying to hit drives in Hawaii when Bradley was battalion commander there. And Bradley comes up to him and Parks says, I don't know what's wrong with these clubs. You know, I just can't seem to get anything, any kind of drive out of this. Bradley takes a club, shoots a 250 or whatever yard drive down, said, hands in the club bag and says, must be you. <laughs> he even spent part of a summer working on the Bear Mountain Bridge. Those of you who have been in the Hudson, the Bear Mountain Bridge is right over a gorge. So you must have some self-confidence and athleticism to work on that. Um, he was really, in a way, one of the boys. He loved the camaraderie of a hunting trip or a card game with the guys, a poker game with the guys. But despite his vigor, he did have some health problems. Numerous allergies, um, bad teeth. Uh, he hit his chin on somebody's head when he was a kid. And because they were poor, they couldn't go to a dentist. So when he was in his 20s and 30s, he had to have his teeth removed. Um, and he, had, he seems to have had some problems with psychosomatic illnesses. Um, and then he finally got his big break, his promotion to Brigadier General and Station to Command. He almost didn't make it down there because he had an ear infection. And he talked his way out of the hospital. Then in Sicily, he had a bad case of hemorrhoids when he came on up the landing craft and had to ride around on a, on a life preserver in his Jeep. <laughs> and D-Day had a big boil on his nose. And funny how these things seem to happen to him a lot, but he just plowed through them. Hmm, let's see. There. Uh, well, there's a lot to talk about in World War II, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. This is his monumental achievement, the uh, Operation Cobra on the left, and then the battle around the fillet's pocket. <clears throat> By early 1943, it was clear that he was going to play a major role in the war. He, was mar he had Marshall's confidence. Marshall uh, remembered him from the infantry school. In February 1943, he goes to North Africa as Eisenhower observed for eyes and ears. And from that point on, you can watch the movie Patton, and you probably have a pretty good idea of what he did. He, uh, he joined the, the American force there just after the deb debacle at Kasserine Pass, one of the worst American defeats in the war. And he assisted Patton in rehabilitating the force. It was at that period that he ran into all that disdain from the British, and that aroused his competitive instincts. You know, Bradley, when Bradley had a real competitive drive, and, uh, you know, that, that seems to him, the British, I don't know whether it was Midwest provincialism or whatever, but, but uh, he, he could get turned off by the British, although on a surf, surf, surface level they got along okay. April 43, he takes over the Second Corps from Patton and performs beautifully in the finale of the campaign. 
His performance in Sicily in the summer of 1943 confirms Marshall's high opinion, and he takes, and Marshall ends up taking him over Patton for the, for the command of the American army at, uh, at Normandy for D-Day. Um, the cross-channel invasion. At, after they land on D-Day and there's the stalemate in Normandy, Bradley has the proudest, well, probably the proudest achievement of his career. He plans Operation Cobra, where the Americans and the British are cordoned, cordoned off in this small section of the Normandy region. Bradley concentrates several divisions and uh, tens of thousands of troops in an artillery, uh, heavy artillery support, and he also calls on some heavy bombers um, from the 8th Air Force to come over and, and blast the German positions in an effort to create a breakthrough in this sector. Unfortunately, you know, we talk about friendly fire now, the bombs fell, many of the bombs fell short and killed American troops as well as German. Well, over a hundred in fact. But, but they were effective enough that they created a breakthrough. And at that point, Bradley introduces George Patton's Third Army, which comes down and splits off. Part of it goes into Brittany and part of it goes around to create the fillet's pocket. If, if Cobra was Bradley's proudest achievement, the fillet's pocket might have been his most controversial because he, as Patton's closing in to, to trap all the, Ameri all the uh, German forces in, the, in that pocket, Bradley halts them because he's concerned about overextension over there. I won't go into all the complexities of the campaign, but I think Bradley underestimates the number of Germans. He thought, I think perhaps because he was such a rational guy, he figured the Germans must be rational too, that they would have gotten out of Dodge by then. But, but he was slow, he ended up sending Patton a deeper development toward Paris. Cobra illustrated Bradley's methodology. It was carefully, methodically planned, prepared, he, he worked nights in his tent with his, ass, with his transparent plastic map with acetate, moving, pinching all the positions. And um, he goes on, of course you have the liberation of Paris, the, uh, the fall campaign against that false stalemate. Bradley gets involved in the strategic debate where he, Eisenhower is having to decide between the narrow thrust to Berlin that Montgomery's advocating and the broad front strategy that that Eisenhower tended to favor. Bradley sees himself as the American advocate. He feels Eisenhower is too much in a position where he has to satisfy both sides. So Bradley becomes, with support from Patton, he becomes the, the uh, main advocate. The Battle of the Bulge is another low point for Bradley where he is surprised by the German attack. He refuses to move his headquarters and as a result Eisenhower takes away his northern armies from him and puts them under Montgomery. And Montgomery being Montgomery, he of course rubs it in, claim, talking about what a good boy I am and how I won the battle. And, you know, I, I came down and helped the Americans, and that just infuriated Bradley. And Montgomery finally found somebody who rubbed it, rubbed, got under his skin. But Eisenhower stuck by him through the breakout in March when the American troops drive across Germany, the bridge at Remagen, and the final victory, where by the end of the war, Bradley is commanding four American armies, the 1st, the 3rd, the 9th, and the 15th. More, more troops in the field than any other American general in history. All right, guys, which one is Brad? Which one is Patton? <laughs> Everybody points right. You're humoring me. <laughs> um, who was it that said that they actually finally heard a video of Patton and they heard that high-pitched voice? Yes, he actually didn't talk like George C. Scott, but, yeah, but maybe that's part of it, he overcompensated. The thing is, Bradley over time becomes much more influential in the development of the U.S. Army than Patton does. Um, but Patton, Patton died in December of 45 from a, in a car accident. But Patton is a major cultural figure. Ironically, in part, he's become a major culture figure, but ironically, in part, because of Bradley being a technical advisor in the movie Patton. Uh, the movie Patton is basically Bradley's picture of Patton. But, uh, 
We, we can get into that at another point, but people are drawn to the colorful personality, the brilliance, the genius of Patton versus seemingly Bradley's basic competence. The, Patton is interesting because contrasting these two brings out certain things. They're about as different as yin and yang, different forms of leadership. Patton was a mix of different personalities. I mean, he, you know, he, Bradley thought he was crazy, maybe he was. Uh, he, Bratton was a prima donna. There was nothing self-effacing about Patton when compared to Bra Bradley. <sighs> Patton was a California native. We in the Midwest would say he was playing a part. Uh, he was an actor. He was a great actor. Very religious man. He could humbly pray to, pray to his God. He had great sensitivity. He came from wealth and he married wealth, a wealthy Boston family, but he could also talk like an Oklahoma mule skinner. The flag, famous flag speech in the movie doesn't catch all of Patton's profanity. He really let loose when he was talking to the troops. Um, but, they, but it wasn't just a personality conflict, it was also a clash of differences in the philosophy of tactics. Patton was a believer in mobility, incessant attacks, keep the enemy off balance, don't worry about the flanks. Bradley would carefully prepare plans, very thorough, worked out logistics, appreciated intelligence, had the keen sense of terrain, um, and they both claimed they were saving lives with their approach. Uh, it's notable, though, that Patton did not move so smartly through the uh, through Lorraine and the Metz forts in the fall of '44 after the front had restabilized. The thing is, Patton gets the glamour, but the, his superiors keep coming back to Bradley. They felt comfortable with him in a way they didn't with Patton. Brad was, Bradley was sound, he was balanced. In a word, he was safe. He was probably ahead of Patton in the pecking order even before the slapping incidents of the summer of 43. Bradley was a recognizable professional who skillfully applied the army at the time. Heck, even Montgomery spoke highly of him. Montgomery, offered, Montgomery was so convinced of the importance of unity of command that he offered to serve under Bradley as an overall ground commander under Eisenhower which was no small thing for Montgomery to say. Okay, wrapping it up. Um, unlike Patton, Bradley had a very notable post-war career. You see it there. He was the VA administrator at perhaps the most crucial point in its history when it expanded enormously. Never more veterans than after World War II. Um, he was chief of staff of the Army during a period of tremendous downsizing, cuts, uh, controversy over defense unification. He later said he wished he had fought more against the cuts in light of the Korean War that gave. During the chief, during the Korean War, he was the chair of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the primary military advisor to Truman, got his fifth star. And when MacArthur was hot, was fired in 1951, it was Bradley that Truman called that Congress called upon to give the counterpoint to MacArthur's no substitute for victory when Bradley told the Senate. Hearing, this is the wrong war in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong enemy. MacArthur was never very fond of Bradley, he called him a dirt farmer. Um, and he, Bradley was also instrumental in the limited war strategy. Later, he became an executive in the Bolivar Co Corporation. Like a lot of these folks, the revolving door, they go off into industry, and he becomes part of the military industrial complex, kind of a different heading for the, for the um, common man. Harry Truman once said, and once asked his interviewer, Merle Miller, um, why did Bradley go take that job at that corporation? And Miller said, I suppose it's because he needed the money. <laughs> Truman said, nobody needs that much money. <laughs> his wife, Mary, died suddenly of leukemia in December of 65, and he marries his child bride, Doris Kitty Bu Esther Kitty Bueller, in September of 66. Um, 31 years younger than he is. Um, there's a whole story there, but we're, we're running out, out of time. <laughs> he becomes an advisor to Lyndon Johnson on Vietnam, one of the most hawkish and one of the most supportive of the, of the wise men that Johnson leaned on in 67 68. After Eisenhower's death in 1969, the last of the five star generals, boy, do I remember that funeral of Eisenhower's. Um, becomes the Grand Marshal at Reagan's inaugural, and he dies in an elevator in April 1981 after receiving an award from the National Institute of Social Sciences. So, quite a career. So who in the end was Omar Bradley? 
Well, like you're probably very tired of this characterization. He's a complex personality, reflecting his background. Son of the heartland with all of its virtues and foibles. Much of the piled image is accurate. He was genial. He was kind to others. I've run into too many people who've met him who talked about how nice he was, how familiar, how, how low-key. Patient, understanding, a great teacher. He had genuine modesty. Uh, it, you can just see from his reaction to Patton's flamboyance and self-promotion, Bradley took, <coughs> Bradley took modesty very seriously. A bit shy. He's not as social. Eisenhower and Patton were partiers. The Eisenhowers and the Patton's, they were very social. And Bradley and Bomar and Mary would attend parties, but they weren't, they weren't quite as involved. He was a moderate drinker, non-smoker, rugged, athletic, and a slender six foot one, if he did have some health issues. Yet, this genial personality of his exterior hides a very shrewd, somewhat wary personality. Um, you read his memoirs, his interviews, the general's life, later in life, show him that his pretty narrow, irritable, even petty. I mean, Forrest Pope hated that biography, hated that book. He told me, he said, that made Bradley look petty, and he wasn't petty. But, um, but I've seen enough of the oral histories to know that in his later in his life, Bradley started coming out with things that, you know, maybe earlier he was trying to be political and nice, and he could be very critical about things. Perhaps at that point he felt in the best Midwest tradition free to tell, tell things as he saw them, be plain spoken. Very ambitious, legacy of his father. A lot of, and I think part of that is you get this <coughs> internal clash within him between his modesty and his ego, and he did have a substantial ego. He was very sensitive to unfairness and justices, the poor kid, and privilege. He could hold grudges. Compared to Eisenhower, also a Midwesterner, he was a bit provincial, although he worked okay with other countries once they established a relationship. Uh, he was no progressive on race and, and, uh, and women's rights. I don't know that you would especially say he was a flaming uh, racist or misogynist or anything like that, but he probably reflected the views of most Missourians of that time. Um, he was very low-key, calm, tight in control of his emotions, could be a little distant even from his family, often lost in thought as staff would see him pondering military problems. Compared to Patton, Patton was more intuitive. Bradley was more of a cool, logical, rational thinker who liked to work things out, very incisive. His high school yearbook, when they signed up, each person called Bradley calculating. He could, and did, fire people quickly if they did not measure up. One of the interesting little sidelights of World War II is Bradley fired a hell of a lot more people than Patton did. Patton could storm and bluster, but in the end, he was very soft-hearted about firing people. Bradley appreciated structure and discipline. He loved everything about West Point. He really was a soldier, maybe more than Eisenhower. It's, he liked the soldier's life. He was serious about his profession. He wasn't just a civilian in uniform, as Ernie Pyle would say, sometimes imply. He agreed with Patton on many disciplinary issues. But in the end, he was a Midwesterner, the son of the Show Me State, often consciously playing up to that stereotype, even when underneath you may not have been that, that same way. Okay, thank you. We have some time for questions. Okay, great. Yeah. Any questions? We're by exhausting you. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned uh, math and arithmetic. Mm -hmm. it must have been uh, some of his uh, strengths with respect to subjects. That's the way he thought. He was a mathematician. Mm -hmm. A colleague of mine uh, told me that to relax his mind, he would do trigonometry and calculus problems. Do you have any background on that? Well, yes. I think um, he was a great teacher, as I said. He grew up with his dad would sometimes sit next with his dad and next to his dad in bed and they'd work out arithmetic problems together. Um, yeah, he, he was, you look at the West Point curriculum at the time, it was very heavy on, on uh, geometry, on, uh, on uh, algebra. Uh, he, he 
One of his, uh, stu one of his uh, students later recalled how patient he was with a particular cadet who just wasn't getting it. You know, he tried to just explain it over and over and over. And the cadet was struck by Bradley's patience, his ability to just keep, you know, just until the light bulb finally went on. So, um, yeah, I think uh, as far as doing trigonometry or so in his spare time, I think in his spare time he probably was more interested in hunting than anything else. But, but yeah, I think uh, that, that that is the way he thought. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What were his experiences in World War One? Good question. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up because Bradley thought World War One ruined his career. He never made it to France. Um, he was with the four. He was graduating. He went into the infantry. He was part of the 14th Infantry um, on the West Coast. And uh, but but they were. But at the time, in early 1918, they were having some problems with the mines up in Butte, Montana, uh, copper miners. Uh, this is a period of considerable labor activism, and one of the big unions was the Industrial Workers of the World, which had some socialist overtones in it, and um, much more militant than the American Federation of Labor. And Bradley, uh, Bradley got along with a lot of the, a lot of the folks in Butte, but he, but he was young. He was about almost about 25 at that point, and he kind of got co-opted by the elites. We were so happy that the army was there to police up the, the uh, undesirables and the miners. And they perpetrated that line, which Bradley bought hook, hook line, and sinker, that, um, that subversives, had in, German subversives, had infiltrated the IWW and the labor unions. And uh, he got involved in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. The army with his company was there to smash the march. Um, he, he, he accompanied police uh, on some raids on Union headquarters, something legally he really shouldn't have been doing. But he got out of town just in time before the Department of Justice investigator got there. And uh, from there he went to Camp Dodge, Iowa, which is about when the flu epidemic hit. Um, but he was in a division that was training to go overseas when the armistice came. So he was, he was very upset that he didn't make it to France. Both he and Eisenhower felt they had ruined their careers by not having been in combat. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Who did the troops like that? That's... Repeat the question. Okay. The gentleman asked, who did the troops like better? And I'm taking you mean between Patton and Bradley. Um, it's almost like I'd have to answer that question separately from each of them, each of them and you can kind of infer. Um, Bradley, of course, Bradley thought that they liked him better because they couldn't understand how Patton could be popular with the troops. Um, and I think Patton just naturally, because he was such a personality, uh, drew a lot of people from both ends of the spectrum. You either, you either had troops who really who respected it and thought, yeah, slap those guys. You know, they're malingerers. They should be up in front fighting. Or you, um, or you had folks who said, you know, our blood, his guts. They didn't. Um, and there seems that I almost get these sense sometimes you could almost run it right down the middle 50 50 in terms of. But it is noteworthy that a lot of people, it seems, who, who weren't so fond of Patton during the war. Afterwards, I served with Patton's Third Army. Bradley, Bradley liked to think that he was he was popular with the soldiers, and uh, I just don't know that he cut his high profile in the end with them. You know, he, he he got around the front certainly quite a bit, but and what soldiers saw, they probably liked. You know, I've, I've run into enough positive comments about him, but. You know, when you're a private soldier down in the ranks, you know your captain. You know you're, you're the, the the army commander is this figure way up on high, unless he just has such a standout personality like that. I don't know that you really feel like you know him. 
Yes, sir. With, the, with his leadership role in the 1948 time, mm -hmm. you mentioned before about his uh, sort of just normal for the day racist attitude. Yeah. What was his role as the Army lead in carrying out the Truman desegregation? Very good question. Um, and frankly, I still have to do a lot of research on this. Um, I can, but I know the basics. And the basics uh, are that uh, Bradley followed the lead of his, uh, his mentor, George Marshall, in a sense, in which basically it was along the lines of the Army should not be a social innovator. You shouldn't use the Army as a lab for social innovation. And you know, he had, you, know, you, you have to kind of dig a little bit with Bradley to find references to race in different places. He, um, you know, he says some things that, in today's terms, um, like when he's talking about, oh, these, uh, these, these uh, singers that were so, these singers that were so uh, effective, you know, so poignant, these, these singing these, these soul to these, uh, Oh gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, but they, 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 these African American singers, and then, and he had a company, and he had, he was involved in the Civilian Conservation Corps in 1933, and he had, he actually supervised an African American company, and he talked about the African Americans who, um, you know, oh, you know, they most of them had never gotten that good a meal in in their lives, and. And he, this one guy just kept coming back for more and more, and, and um, you know, it, it's generally I think it's you can, you can kind of read some things into this perhaps. Um, I don't I don't think he was a great innovator on it. I don't think he was necessarily awful on it, but he wasn't he wasn't leading the charge in integration. I can tell you that. But he was in the leadership role at the time of the administration of the new yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Well, he was the chief of staff of the army in 1948, correct? In July 1948. So, um, and like I say, I have more research to do on this, but uh, given what I've looked at to this point, um, well, when you're trying to find things like this, a lot of it, a lot of it is very hidden. And um, you know, it's like somebody would ask me, "Well, did he have any African American uh, classmates in school growing up?" And you don't really see it talked about that much, but I would imagine, I think there was a rule in Missouri at that point that if you had more than 15 African Americans in a school, you needed to create a separate school. So um, on behalf of the Friends of the, of the Hackley Public Library, I'm honored to present this award to you. Um, and it is very fitting that you would yeah. be awarded this. And, but the event is not complete. Um, we are going to be going over to the library for a little while for some light refreshments. You probably have more questions. You'd probably love a chance to talk to If you're not exhausted. So we're going to whisk him over to the library so that he doesn't get caught up here. But um, head over there and uh, take a few minutes. We're, the library is closed. So go to the front door and we'll be letting people in. And um, so we hope that you are able to come over to the library for a little while. So, thank you.